At the age of 52, Steve Newport developed memory problems. He was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's and deteriorated quickly over the next few years, despite medication. His wife, Dr. Mary Newport, found out about two different drug trials and wanted to sign up Steve for one of them. The screenings for the trials were scheduled on two consecutive days and the night before the screening, she did some research about potential drugs against Alzheimer's, just in case Steve will be approved for one of the trials. During her research, she found another recently published study that showed improvements of people with Alzheimer's. She also found that the drug used in this specific study contained medium-chain triglycerides, or short, MCTs. She also discovered that coconut oil is rich in MCTs and calculated that only two tablespoons of coconut oil would give her 20 grams of MCT oil, which is the concentration used in the drug trial. However, since it was late at night and the first screening was scheduled early, she couldn't do much about it anymore. The next day, they went to the first screening. The required minimum score to be approved for the trial was a 16 out of 30 points on the mental status exam. But Steve was only able to score 14 on the screening of the first day. Out of frustration, Mary went to the next door and bought some coconut oil. The next day, on the morning of the second screening, Mary gave Steve coconut oil with breakfast. And approximately 4 hours later, he managed to score 18 out of 30 points on the mental exam. 4 points more than the previous day. Steve continued to consume coconut oil for the next months and improved drastically. Here are 3 clocks he drew before the intervention, 14 days after daily eating coconut oil and 36 days later. So what does coconut oil has to do with Alzheimer's? And if one person could reverse his Alzheimer's, shouldn't we be able to replicate this? To answer the first question, we need to look at how Alzheimer's is sometimes diagnosed. A so-called PET scan looks at how glucose is metabolized. In Alzheimer's patients, the glucose uptake in the brain is often impaired due to insulin resistance of brain cells, which leads to starvation and death of the neurons. In Steve's case, Coconut oil provided an alternative energy source for his brain. However, for many decades it was thought that our brain can only run on glucose. This dogma was challenged in 1967 when Dr. Kale and his team fasted subjects for 40 days and found that during starvation the brain switches to another fuel and obtains two thirds of its energy from ketone bodies. Ketone bodies are small water soluble molecules that can be used as an alternative fuel when glucose is low. Starvation is not the only way to increase ketone body production in the body. As Steve has done it, ingesting MCT rich coconut oil is one way to achieve ketosis. MCTs are rapidly converted to ketones in the liver and raise blood ketone levels. The ketones then provided energy to Steve's insulin resistant brain cells and improved his cognition. Another way to achieve ketosis would be a classic ketogenic diet, where about 70% of the calories come from fat, 25% from protein and only 5% from carbohydrates. The ketogenic diet was originally developed as a treatment for epilepsy. Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, a researcher at the University of South Florida, who works on applications of ketones and ketogenic diets, speaks in his TED talk about the case of Mike Dancer. Mike used a variety of anti-seizure medication and the medication caused severe side effects and was not able to control his seizures. So due to the severe side effects, Mike stopped all the anti-seizure medication. And when he did, he saw an increase in his seizure frequency. At about this time, Mike discovered that there was a dietary intervention that he could use to control his seizures. And when he did, he found a sharp decrease in his seizure frequency. Mike is not an exception. About two-thirds of children with multi-drug resistance epilepsy improve significantly on a ketogenic diet. By now there are many applications of a ketogenic diet to improve health, including weight loss and the control of blood sugar. But let's go back to Alzheimer's. In his excellent book The End of Alzheimer's, Dr. Dale Bradison describes that there are different causes of Alzheimer's and one of them is insulin resistance of the brain. 
In fact, many leading experts in the field are now calling Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes. Actual mechanisms in the brain that relate to insulin has caused people like myself to actually call Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes. As a side note, people with type 2 diabetes are three times more likely to develop Alzheimer's. Certainly, Alzheimer's is a complex disease with different causes, but as part of his treatment plan, Dr. Bretherson suggests a so-called KetoFlex diet with the goal to have ketones in the range of 0.5 to 4 millimoles per liter and recommends MCT oils as part of the strategy. He publishes unprecedented success to reverse Alzheimer's in 2014, where 9 out of 10 patients displayed improvements in cognition, and again in 2016, when 10 out of 10 patients with Alzheimer's improved on his protocol. In his book he also explains how difficult it was to get the trials approved, as everyone was simply looking for one drug to cure Alzheimer's. However, it is unlikely that such a drug will ever exist. Dr. Bradison illustrates Alzheimer's like a roof with 36 holes and says that If you are going to help yourself, if you take a drug for Alzheimer's, it patches one hole. It patches the hole beautifully, but it's only one hole. So we want to patch all the holes. And the good news is we can patch all the holes and the drugs are helpful. You can use them, but you want to use them with it, the background of the program. We have seen that a ketogenic diet can certainly help people with neurodegenerative diseases. But what about healthy individuals? Could we boost brain function with ketones? Mary Newport explains in her TED talk that insulin resistance in the brain can occur 10 to 20 years before any symptoms of cognitive decline begin to appear, suggesting that a ketogenic diet would be a worthwhile attempt to prevent cognitive decline. Many people actually enter ketosis through fasting or a ketogenic diet to improve brain function. A study found that a ketogenic diet significantly improved cognitive performance in rats. And this case study, written by Dr. Di Lorenzo, shows how two twin sisters improved their migraine through a ketogenic diet. Before starting the diet, both sisters experienced an average of 5 to 6 attacks per month of severe throbbing headache, lasting sometimes for 72 hours. However, as we can see in this table, where they marked the degree of migraine ranging from 1 to 3, the migraine stopped entirely after the second day of being on a ketogenic diet, but reappeared after the diet was stopped. The authors of the case study speculate about the potential mechanism behind it and cite papers that show how ketones increase the blood flow to the brain and improve mitochondrial efficiency meaning that ketones provide a more efficient fuel for the brain while using less oxygen and generating fewer free radicals. Another interesting piece of anecdotal evidence comes from Dr. D'Agostino. He explains in his podcast with Tim Ferriss how he was able to double his breath hold time from 2 to 4 minutes while being in deep ketosis. The last point I want to make here is that the brain is the most energy hungry organ consuming about 25% of the body's energy while only contributing to 2% of its total weight. Our ability to use ketone bodies has allowed humans to survive long periods of starvation. At some point in our life, we have all been into ketosis. Compared to the 25% of the energy an adult brain uses, the brain of a newborn consumes about 75% of the daily energy and nearly half of it is actually provided by ketone bodies. Even a week later, after the carbohydrate content of breast milk increases, they still rely on parts on ketone bodies as an energy source. There's much more to say about this topic, and Alzheimer's is a complex disease that can be caused by other factors than insulin resistance of the brain. For more information, I suggest you check out Dr. Bredesen's book, as his method shows an unmatched success rate. He describes different cases and how a personalized nutritional approach is needed. If you want to learn more about insulin's role in Alzheimer's, I recommend Amy Berger's book The Alzheimer Antidote. Thanks for watching and let me know in the comment section if you want to have more of those specific videos. Also consider subscribing to help me bring out more content. See you next time.